Be seated for a second. Just a second. Yeah. I, I'm going to be 10 minutes. I promise. 10 minutes. Watch this. One of the greatest fights of the Israelites. Stay with me. Stay with me. One of the greatest fights of the Israelites came from the land of Edom. Edom is the byproduct of Esau and him leaving his father's home and being cursed and being angry at his brother. So he produces a nation called Edom. Everybody say Edom. So Israel is in constant warfare with Edom. Edom has become three times larger than Israel in the text that I'm going to show you. Somebody say, sometimes the odds are against me. Are you here? Uh, watch this. And so Israel cannot go forward until God gives them a word. Because oftentimes they went to battle on their own feelings and their own attitudes and they would lose. So they had to have a prophetic word from God to move forward. So they stood in 122 pounds of armor in the middle of the noonday sun at attention, waiting on a word from God to go forward and fight against an army three times greater, stronger, and more powerful. And watch this. The greatest adversary you will ever face is a wounded one. Israel is not fighting from a wounded spirit. They were the tricksters. They, they were a product of Jacob. Esau is a wounded person. And sometimes the most dangerous person you could ever fight is somebody that is already wounded. Are you hearing me? Single people, be careful. Whenever you start dating somebody that ain't over the last person that they were connected to. It's a dangerous combination. Are you here? And so they're standing there. Sweat is pouring from their, from their brow down their backs they're in the heat of the middle east i don't know if you're like me but i picture myself standing by two warriors saying i don't know when god's going to say something but i sure hope he says something soon because if the enemy don't kill us this heat's going to get us they were standing there and i read in my bible it's, 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 it reads like this in Isaiah 63. The Bible says that the prophet Isaiah steps up on the scene and makes this declaration. I don't know if television has Isaiah 63, 1. But it makes this declaration. It says, Who is this that cometh from Eden with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Isaiah is looking down toward the road and the battle and sees a figure coming down the road. He says, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, thy garment like him that treadeth in the wine vat? And he says in verse 3, watch, it switches. Now the figure that, it, that Isaiah is seeing opens his mouth and says, I have trodden the winepress alone and of the people there was none with me for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. Verse 4, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my, in, in my hand and the year of my redeemed, huh, y'all ain't hearing me, is come. Tell somebody, say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And let me tell you real quick, 
Vengeance is not when God finds your adversary and pays them back. Vengeance is when God finds you and pays you back for everything the enemy's done in your life. That's when vengeance is at its full work. Somebody shout hallelujah. Watch this now. Watch this now. I'm, I'm, I'm closing right now. Uh, Y'all don't even realize it. Watch this. A miracle has taken place. I came to Wednesday night Bible study. That's what everybody's having across America now because nobody wants to have church no more. So they have Bible study. A little group of people get together. But I like coming to World Harvest Church where we have church on Wednesday night. And whoever missed out is going to miss out on it. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you're in the middle of it, but it's Wednesday. Oh, Y'all didn't hear me. Tell somebody on the other side of you. Say, neighbor, you're in the middle of it, but it's Wednesday. Oh, hallelujah. What I love about that story is this, Pastor Germain. Watch this. The army is arrayed and ready to go to battle against Edom. But all of a sudden, Isaiah sees this figure coming down the dusty road. As Randy Phillips wrote, there's a promise back in the day coming down your dusty road. And all of a sudden, Isaiah begins to describe what he sees. He says, I see an individual that is coming from Edom and it looks like he's been in a wine vat pressing down grapes because his garment is red like grapes and the voice that's in the middle of the road y'all didn't hear what I said the voice that was in the middle of the road said I decided to show up today to let you know that it is I saith the Lord and the Bible says that God said this is not wine juice this is blood dripping from my garment and I did it all by myself Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying? You say, Pastor, please break that down. I'm glad you asked me to. Notice, the battle is in Edom. They're about to go to Edom. But all of a sudden, they see something coming from Edom. In other words, if you're wondering tonight where the hell God is, Touch your neighbor say, I know you one day every now and then. In the middle of your hell, where is God? Have you ever been in the middle of something and said, God, where are you? Can I tell World Harvest Church? What's the date? I don't even know the date. The what? It's the 18th? Wednesday, the 18th. You can shout it. God, where are you? You want me to tell you what God's telling you? God said, I'm already in Thursday on the 19th fighting the battle that you are going to have to fight all by yourself. Touch two or three people and tell a neighbor he's already got the victory and he's brought it back to you to give it to you meeting in the middle of the road stay where you are stay where you are so watch what we do watch this we don't have the promise of tomorrow we only have today this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. Y'all, y'all, in it. Some of y'all been waiting to praise him after it. But I came to Columbus to tell you, praise him while you're still in it. Because while you're praising, he's in your tomorrow. 
fighting for you. Where's my crazy praises at? Throw your hands up and thank him. Give him a praise on credit. Give him a praise on credit. I'm done. Listen. Listen to me. I was going to preach all kind of stuff, but God interrupts things. God, yes. Where are you? He said, I, I showed up early so that you wouldn't have to go through what you're having to go through. Sometimes when he shows up early, it seems like he's showing up late. And I've asked God, why are you letting me go through this? I mean, I know I ain't perfect. I heard a preacher the other day, he pointed his finger at the camera on Christian TV. He said, I ain't, liquor ain't never passed these lips. He said, smoke ain't never passed these lips. He said, I ain't never cut, used a cuss word in my life. He said, I ain't never been to a club. I ain't never been to an R-rated movie. He said, these lips have never kissed anybody but my wife. I turned him off. I couldn't relate. I've done all that since I've been pastoring. I'm just trying to be transparent. I know y'all holy and all that, but there's a few of y'all that's had some BC days. You know what that is? Before Christ. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all got some DC days during Christ. Say, God, why are you letting me go through all of this turmoil and this trouble? And God says, because sometimes... I need to let you get to a place where you realize it could only be me and nothing else that got you through it. They ran out to meet Jesus in the middle of the road while Lazarus was laying in a grave. And I didn't know this until I studied deep into the text and studied the culture of the text. Jesus Lazarus is sick and the Bible says Jesus stayed where he was while his friend was sick now in, in chapter 2 he showed up at somebody's wedding he didn't even know and turned water into wine did y'all hear me? before chapter 11 watch this he took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people he never met in his life. Is anybody here? In chapter 4, he sat at a well and talked with a woman that had been hoeing around for years. Five ex-husbands and the one she's living with she wasn't even married to. But he went and sat and took time with her. Who needs friends like that? That'll minister to strangers. And do miracles for people that you don't even know. But when I need him, he stays where he is. And I didn't know it until I studied the generational text of that day. And do you know that in that day, they did not give any miracles credit for the resurrection of the dead. Because they believed that the spirit of a man hovered over his body for 72 hours. So Jesus said, if I come over there and raise him from the dead within two days, they're going to say it was the spirit that was hovering over him. But if I wait till he starts stinking. And I show up late. Sometimes when he shows up late, he shows up early. Are you here? And they took the three Hebrew boys and bound them they made a mistake they shouldn't have bound them together
But the scripture says in Daniel chapter 3, they bound them. And the minute they bound them, time had to be erased. And protocol had to be erased. Because wherever two or three are gathered together, he said, there am I in the midst but he said in my name well nobody was saying the name of Jesus but the trouble is is they bound the three and put them in the fire and when Nebuchadnezzar looked in the midst of the fire he said I see one two three four like they say at my church and he says and the one that's the fourth looks like the son of God wait a minute pastor Bill you're a theologian the son of God will not have a picture taken until Luke chapter 1 so how do we know what Jesus looks like all the way back in Daniel chapter 3 because God has a way of being pulled out of tomorrow and brought back into your today to tell you it's gonna be all right so I came to tell you on a Wednesday night don't worry about it praise him in the middle of your week because the midst somebody shout he'll come in the middle and take me over Lift your hands in this place and give God a praise. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. My God is awesome. He can move mouth. Keep me Hide me. Hide me from the rain. My God My is all awesome. awesome. heals me when I'm broken. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where Strength I've been weakened. I've been weakened. And forever, forever he will reign. Come on, somebody say it. My, My God, God is all awesome. He can move a mountain. He can And it hides me from hides the rain. From the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever He will reign. Father, we thank you tonight because we understand that you are the man in the middle. We are not confused tonight that Calvary placed you in the midst. And we are not confused that you were put in the midst on a cross that is shaped like a plus. Because we had the advantage with you in the middle. We thank you tonight for showing up right in the middle of our issue. Right in the middle of our turmoil and our trouble. And bringing to us the victory of tomorrow's battle. Letting us know it's in the midst of our trouble that you show up to declare who you are, what you are, and where you are. Everybody say, He is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I don't have yesterday. I'm not in tomorrow. But I'll praise Him in my today. How many will give Him the praise right now in your today? How many are giving the praise in your today? You can be seated in this place. Right in front of you, sitting in this building. Watch this. Every person in this building, you're in the midst of some type of issue in your life financially. And when we talk about these things, we rarely, we rarely keep our ears open. We shout while the word is going, but whenever... The demand is made we close things off not too long ago 
I had a pastor appreciation and a young man, a line of people came and gave me an, an offering for being their pastor, their head of their life spiritually. And I kept seeing this young man drift to the back, drift to the back. He kept being the last one in the line. I watched him. He would look back and if there were two or three people, he'd go to the back, go to the back. He wanted to be last. And I thought, oh Lord, he's going to tell me his life story. But when he finally got to me, 26 year old young African American young man, he was holding an orange tie in his hand. And he said, Pastor, the reason I wanted to be last is because he said, I'm embarrassed. It was all crumped up, rolled up, Pastor. He said, this is all I have. He said, it's the nicest thing I have. He said, it's my tie. I'm the assistant manager at Popeye's. And this is the tie I had to buy for Popeye's. And he said, it's the nicest thing I have. But I wanted to give it to you because I don't have any money. And I didn't want to leave without giving you something because you've been a blessing to my life. I held that orange tie with grease on it. And I prayed for him and watched him walk out of that door. And I told him, don't ever put your head down whenever you've done your best. Are you here? I read a little thing the other day. It said, I gave you $20. He gave you $100. And you love him more. But what you didn't realize is, he gave you $100 and he had thousands. I only had 20. Are y'all here? He walked out that back door. Four months after he walked out of that back door, my head ushers and armor bearers came to where I am in the green room and knocked on the door and said, there's a man and a woman, very, very well dressed outside, elderly, they would like to see you before the service starts. I walk out the door and there they stand, stately, beautiful dressed, beautifully dressed. The gentleman stretched his hand out and said, I just wanted to meet you and tell you you've changed my life. I said, well, thank you so much. I said, are you a part of our church? He said, no, I've, I've never heard you preach. I said, okay. I said, uh, have you ever heard any of our music? He said, no, I didn't even know you were a singer. I said, okay. He said, I, I don't know anything about you. I said, well, how have I changed your life? He said, you probably don't remember a young man four months ago and he named the young man. He said, he gave you an orange tie from Popeye's on your pastor appreciation. I said, yes, I do. He said, that was my nephew. He said, I was diagnosed with cancer a year and a half ago. And I've been going back and forth to Cleveland, Ohio to the Mayo Clinic. And he said, we don't have any kids, my wife and I, he's my nephew. So I called him and I said, I want you to come take my business in Jacksonville, Florida. And my, so he said, my nephew, moved to Jacksonville and now he owns the business my wife and I had for 32 years in Jacksonville. I looked at him and I said, well, what type of business is it? He said, it's a men's clothing store. Are you here? And every, every month on the first, he would mail me, he just sold the business five years ago, but he would mail me a brand new Pencaldi tie on the first of every month. And on, on top of it, he would say, he would say, you have changed my life. This gentleman looked at me and he I said, well, how did I change your life? He said, the day I gave my business to that nephew of mine, the next week we went back to Cleveland, Ohio, and they did a scan and the doctor said, I don't know how to say this, but there is no cancer in your body at all. And he said, he looked at his wife and he said, well, what are we going to do about Leonard? She said, are you crazy? She said, I believe that that was God. That the minute we gave that business away, God took your situation into his own hands. Are you here? Are y'all listening to me? When you get an opportunity to give, you need to understand that behind every seed, there is a miracle waiting on you. I want every person to reach in front of you and get an envelope in your hand. 
Get an envelope in your hand right now. Every one of you. I'm not suggesting it. I'm telling you to do it. This is a commandment. Amen. Hold it up right now. Hold it up so I can see you're being obedient. Hold it up so I can see you're being obedient. If you're on the front row, reach back and grab you one. On the back of it, on the back of it, I want you to write, He's God in the middle. He's God in the middle. A seed cannot get to the middle until it leaves your hand. It's in your hand, it's in the ground, then it produces fruit. But it can't get to the middle until it's released out of your hand. So as long as it's in your hand, and I don't care who thinks you can come, I'll, I dare anybody to challenge me. As long as I've got an apple seed in my hand, a tree will never be born. But when I put it in the soil and step back, now I'm watching it in the middle. And I'm telling you that whatever you put in that envelope tonight, if you're watching my way of streaming, whatever you sow right now, you are sowing in the middle. You don't see the harvest. All you see is the seed, but you're about to let it disappear into the middle. But here's good news. And then I'm going, I'm going to shut up and give it to Pastor Bill. Here's the good news. Watch this. Look down at that seed. Look down at it. Now I'm telling you, if you're looking down at nothing, get ready for nothing to come back. But watch this. Look down at that seed. You see it? You are what's right with the church. Watch this. You see it? You do? What happens whenever you sow a seed? It goes into the ground and now you cannot see it. Here's the good news. While we look not at the things which are seen. Wait a minute. As long as you can see it, it's temporary. But the moment you can no longer see it, it's eternal. It lasts forever. That's why when I go back to Louisiana and my grandfather planted pear trees, my kids climb on them and our kids' kids are climbing on them and picking pears. And my grandfather's been dead since 1969. Because watch this, if you want to hold on to that seed, you can hold on to it if you want to, but it's temporary in your hand. But the minute you release it and you can no longer see it, God says it becomes eternal and it will last forever. But it will not last until you put it in the middle. Now raise it high, raise it high, raise it high in the midst of this sanctuary. Father, we thank you for sowers. We thank you for givers. We thank you for those that are watching live around the world that are not sitting in their homes and doing nothing, but they're sowing right now in the midst of this season because you're God of the middle. And we know that this seed will last longer than us. It'll be a tree that will produce for generations to come. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. Lift your hands. Lift your hands with that seed one more time. One more time. And just declare it. Just say, oh, my God is awesome. Tell him. He can move mountains. Keep me in Keep the valley. Me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Strength when I've been weakened. Forever he will reign. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever. Worship him as you're giving.
somebody needs to thank Bishop Clint Brown for sharing that word with us. Come on now, that was a Wednesday night message right there that we can take all week long.